Welcome to this episode of PDA Nation's Making Change Together podcast. I'm Carl Wilkerson, one of the hosts of PDA Nation. Making Change Together is an online educational resource project that seeks out case stories of people making a difference in their communities and in the lives of other people so that they can be studied to better understand social change. This project was inspired, in part, by the book Talking About Social Problems, published in 2003 by Rutledge. In January 2020, my co-host, Dr. Patty Thomas, sat down with the author of the book, Dr. Lusky, in her home in Florida to discuss the Making Change Together project, Social Constructionism and the Future of Teaching Sociology, and specifically Teaching Social Problems in the New World of Post-Truth and Mounting Social Issues. Let me start off by asking you, though. Are you interested you're interested in the social construction of social problems? Okay? Yes. Are you interested in teaching and research and activism in all three? All in, three. All three. Yeah, the project that this video is going to be up on, Making Change Together, is looking at how to study people who make a difference in the world. So the idea behind it is to take a lot of the work that you and Joel Best and even back to Katus, is that how you say his name? Katsutsi, yeah. And um, Spectre and all, and ask the question, can we do the same kind of studying for the way people actually uh, affect change in their communities? So That's interesting. part of what we want to do is look at the social construction of social problems, but we also want to start looking at the construction of solutions. And which, is, which is needed, which is needed. Yes, and really I'm very, uh, I know that Joel Best published an article, I think it was in 2015, 2016 that I read, where he said we now have, hi, we now, have, that's fine, the cat will be fine, don't worry. So we, um, <laughs> You're gonna go to jail. <laughs> um, so he was saying that we now have looked at enough case histories to really start having some generalization, yes. and general understanding. Yes. yes. So what I'm hoping is to collect enough case histories of social change that we can begin to analyze that and find commonalities in the process of how change comes about. Because sociologists only talk about social change in terms of social movements and grand kinds of things. You know, that's what most of them get so, caught up sociologists, in. Sociologists, we're digging ourselves into a hole. I think so, too. We, we really are. And um, to answer your first question about social construction, should it be taught? Um, in my humble opinion, and of course I'm slightly biased, this is the only perspective that teaches students critical thinking. Yes. It's the only perspective that, that teaches them to not accept the world as it is, to ask, how did the world get this way? Um, why are we worrying about some things and not others? Um, how is it, not, not only why is it and not, but it, it's how is the world this way? And I think that we're not doing enough of that, and it's only in the social construction perspective that you can do that. Yes. So to answer your question about in this crazy world that we live in of, you know, post, they call it post-truth. That's, well, that's a scary thing. That's really scary. You know, there's facts and alternative facts and fake news and whatever. Uh, we have got to teach students how to step back, slow down, stop. Just stop and say, okay, what's going on here? Who's doing it? How are they doing it? What are they doing? What are the consequences of it? So, so I'm, I'm very much a believer in the social construction perspective to lead social change. I think that the perspective, as far as um, making advances in theory, I think that's pretty much done. I think it's pretty, I, I agree with Joel. Um, my own work, I've moved on to narrative. And I'm dealing now, my interest now is in public persuasion. How do you convince people to worry about some things? What kinds of stories, you know, people, situations, scenes, convince people to worry? Or conversely, convince people to ignore something? Yes. So when you've got like the immigrants on the border and all of that that's going on, that, that 
the absurd of kids in cages. What kinds of stories are driving that policy? So anyway, so, so that's, a, that's social constructionism going into more of a, how is this, how is this happening? And what is the source of information? What is the source of it? What is the yeah. source of it? Yeah. And, and I think that, um, I don't know, I, I think that we sociologists, when I look at my colleagues, so many of my colleagues want to teach students what to think. They want to teach students to have a critical perspective, to um, think about things in particular ways. And I'm always saying, maybe I'm just assured enough of myself, but I think that if we train students how to think, they're going to pretty much think how I think. Right, that's, that's <laughs> quite my bottom line. Um, so, so I don't think, to answer your question about how, should, how can we change teaching social problems, I don't think we get much when we bludgeon students. You know, when we say, you're a conservative, how can you be a conservative, you must be stupid, right? Um, if we taught them rather, let's look at what's going on here. Let's look at who's, who's doing this, who's standing, who's standing to benefit from this, and to cut out some of the noise. And uh, to take that a step further, I also think there have been times in teaching my students how to think instead of what to think that they've made arguments to me that have changed the way I think yeah, exactly. and uh, that they actually are now because I teach in a um, in a most of the students that I teach their first generation right right I right. teach in a community college so I have a lot of students who never been to college before, don't have family members who have been to college before, don't have that kind of resources available to them. And so oftentimes in the papers that I read and in the class discussions, when we are talking about critical thinking, looking at that perspective, I end up learning exactly. from their exactly. experience exactly. because exactly. they're living a life that is not in my in my exactly. social world. And if you, if you really consider the dimensions of their lives, their opportunities, uh, their, their constraints, their, their lives, right? What they think becomes not so stupid. Yeah. You know, it becomes not so stupid at all. Not and, irrational. And not all. irrational, not stupid, not a basket of deplorables. But I know it's hard because cause those of us who do this stuff, we, we have a real tendency, I mean, we, we, we share values, and our values are very, not the values that are in a sentence today. So I understand it, it's really hard. Um, but I think that if we're gonna have a chance to do social change as academics, I think that we have to do that. And, and I wanna continue too with your concern about solutions. I think that's another way that we're messing up. The social construction perspective because of historical flukes, Spectre and Katsutu were writing in the 1970s, and there was a um, huge fight about positivism, about the objective nature of reality. There was a huge fight. And so Constructing Social Problems, their book that became the Bible for Constructionists, is about that fight. It, it picks a fight with Object, objectivist, right? That is so old. It is so old, it's so worn out. And still, when you read articles, it's still this, the subjective approach, the constructionist approach is better. And I'm like, no, it's not better, it's different. Yeah. It gets you to a different set of questions, a different set of solutions, a different kind of research. Yes. But we don't have to trash the objective thing, we just have to say, and they're doing something different. And complementary yeah. often. Yeah, complementary, and it's yes. not, we're not opposing. So, so I think that all of the, I think that all the breath that we take to fight with the other side, I think that that's, that's useless. Because I think, that, I think that the constructionist perspective could be developed far more to talk about solutions. Because if, if what we call claims makers, if they're successful. We have new policy, we have new programs, we have a public consciousness. 
that does things, and that does things that are very material. So where Spectre and Katsuzi said, you know, just completely forget about an objective reality. Just completely forget about it. I think that's not right, because I think that when you are successful, you change consciousness. Consciousness changes attitudes. It, can, it changes the way that people act toward each other. It can change policy, it can change programs and whatever. So that becomes very real. And construction say, oh, no, we, we're not dealing with that. And I think, no, 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 take that, grasp that. Yeah. Grasp that, take that as our own and say, there is a material reality. It is constructed for sure, but it is a material reality. Yes. It is, it is real. It has real consequences it is real. It is real. in people's lives. Well, take the ADA. That is very real. We were yeah. talking earlier about that. Because of the ADA, you get something that you wouldn't have had before. Yes. I have a student whose part of her dissertation was looking at the federal, um, I think it was Senate, um, testimonies that led, led to the ADA. And what she did is she looked at the characteristics of the people who were called upon to testify and what they said, uh. right? So it's a, it's a narrative thing and what they said. And it's really interesting though because the ADA, it's successful when you start talking about obvious disabilities, physical disabilities. But when you start talking about people who have psychological problems, people who have chronic diseases, People who have episodic, the ADA is no good. Yeah. And you can trace that right back to the kinds of people that were called upon to testify. Yes. Yeah. So that's very real. Right? It was constructed. And, yeah, very constructed. It was guessing. constructed. Yeah. It gets into the stories that were told. <laughs> the consequences, you got a policy and the policy does a whole bunch of stuff for some people and not very much for other kinds of people. And so then you get into this. You know, what are you going to do with chronic pain? Yeah. You know, and that... What do you do when people are, are perfectly functional one day and... Right, the episodic. Yeah, the episodic. and not functional the next. Right. And so forth. Um, what inspired me to do the Making Change Together project was I wrote a paper in graduate school, 1996, I think it was, and I found this article. There was... Um, uh, Frances LePay-Moore, or Moore LePay, I never, I get her last two names. She did, um, she's most famous for talking about food systems. And, um, but she had a project in the 1990s about democracy. And she created a, a newswire service, similar mm -hmm. to um, AP or something like that, but concentrated on local stories where democracy works. Right? Yeah, that's great. That's it, great it was yeah. a very positive kind of thing. And there was a story that I picked up on. There's a group in San Antonio, Texas, that um, they, they already had, I mean, it's, it's also kind of a lesson in social capital, because they fought gerrymandering in the early 1980s through what they called a penny <coughs> protest. The way a penny protest works is that hundreds of people would go downtown and on one afternoon they would bring all the change that they had and they would go into banks and get the banks to turn it into currency. And so there'd be like hundreds of people lined up clogging the system. Right. And then the next day they'd all show up with the currency and ask them to convert it back into change. <laughs> And they, and they went down there every day uh, and just literally made downtown stop working. Right, right. <clears throat> and basically, the, the banks said, what do you want? And they said, we want changes in the way that the districts, we want more Latino representation, more accurate representation. And so they you know, went to the Chamber of Commerce and said, we need to do something about this, and they put pressure on the politicos, and they succeeded. Mm -hmm. So fast forward to late, like 1989, 1990, Levi Strauss moved its factory 
to Mexico and a whole bunch of people who had fairly good paying, not highly skilled jobs sewing blue jeans lost their jobs. So you had a whole bunch of people out of work who didn't really have more modern skills to get work. So the same networks that had done the penny protest started having uh, focus groups in homes. The center of this was a Catholic church and a priest mm -hmm. who brought the community together. Again, this was mostly the Latino population that were affected by this. And because they had already established relationships with businesses who understood that, you know, if, if we don't listen to you guys, you're going to be downtown right. <laughs> right. Right. wreaking havoc again. Right. And from this emerged a program called Quest. So Quest is a one-stop shopping type approach to helping people who are trying to shift careers midstream. So basically, they put together all the welfare stuff, all the business stuff, all the training stuff. And so if you were a single mother, for instance, there would be like $30,000 set aside for you to be able to train as a certified nursing assistant or as a truck driver or some other um, usually eight to 10 month program. And there would be an actual job waiting for nice. you at the yeah. end of the training, nice. right? And you could go in and because you needed babysitting services, but you didn't, but you had a car, so you didn't need transportation, the money would go towards childcare, right? So tuition, childcare, so forth. Whereas somebody else didn't need childcare but needed, you know, bus passes mm -hmm. or whatever. Right. So you could sit there and negotiate all these state programs and get the package that would make you succeed. Nice. Wonderful program, still in existence. But they, this was in San Antonio, they decided to move it to Houston. But in Houston, they imposed it top down. So mm -hmm. we figured out how all of that works. Now we're just going to go over in this other community. We're going to set it up. Well, it didn't set up. It didn't set up, yeah. The businesses right. weren't into it. The people, it didn't come from the people. Right. So they just felt like it was one more government program. Mm -hmm. was, now, they may have actually created a very similar program, but they needed to start with, what my, my paper started was they needed to start with that capital building right. Right. And, uh, instead of with right. the outcome. And the more I've looked at this over the years, the more I think that that's how solutions get done. That when you have a top-down kind of solution, it doesn't work because you don't have the process. And, uh, mm -hmm. and what I'm interested in is how do we uncover that process? Not so that we can go and tell people this is how you have to solve it, but rather these are the questions you need to ask that's right. to figure out your solution. Right. Right. in order to do it. And it's been, since I've been looking, I see it everywhere. Like every time I find a successful program, I see this, this process in place. This kind of bottom-up, grassroots process is, leads to the most successful of solutions. So that's what I'm interested in exploring with this. And that's kind of what inspired the beginning of that, is to really take a look at, like, what, are, what do people do in order to find the solutions that they find. So, and I'm curious what you think of that or what... Oh yeah, that, that, makes, that makes total, total sense. Um, and do you think a constructionist approach is a good tool to look at that kind of thing? I don't know. Um, constructionism, well, okay. It depends on how you define constructionism. If you define the core of constructionism in a Peter Berger, Thomas Lindgren, Clifford Geertz, Murray Edelman type of a way. It's, it's just to focus on um, subjective meaning making. Right. Okay. So it makes a lot of sense because what you're saying is that when meaning this start to quote Dorothy Smith, you know, meaning that is particular, local, idiosyncratic, done for 
by with people who are involved. That's going to be meaning that makes more sense than meaning that comes from someplace else, yeah. right? Because meaning, meaning is cognitive, emotional, and moral. And so when you're talking about social change, social problems, social change, it's all about meaning. How am I going to think about this? How do I feel about this? And what are the moral implications? And so in reality, these kinds of meanings are always, we think how we feel, we feel how we think. Yeah. Morality is something we think about, but it's also something we feel. And so, and so the study of meaning making, that's what you're doing. And you're, and you're saying the meaning made, in particular the local, the idiosyncratic, that's, that's Dorothy's, Dorothy's um, way of saying it, that's going to make more sense. That's going to make more sense. Yep. And so therefore it's going to be more effective. Yep. It's going to be more effective because, because what does and doesn't make sense depends on practical experience and local understandings of the way that the world works and the way the world should work. And so again, you've got when the meaning is coming from someplace else, that's not the meaning that's going to make sense for the here and now and these people. Yep. So yeah. So yeah, I, I think that's that's very much within the constructionist tradition. I don't think the constructionist, that's the kinds of things that I do. I don't think that Spectrum Katsutsi gets you there. Right. Because um, Spectrum Katsutsi, it was wonderful. It was, it was a wonderful start. It's hard to criticize, you know, because it was a wonderful start, but it's, it, it's got to be updated. It's got to be updated. Yeah. It's just not... It's just not, just not right anymore. Yeah. The 70s were a unique time in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah, they were. And in both the world and in sociology. Yeah. And I think that a whole perspective, you know, because we've got all the strict constructivism versus contextual construction. Oh, who cares? You know, I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's like it's, it's spun around. Yeah. It's spun around. And strict constructionism means we don't look at the world at all. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. it it renders us, if not irrelevant, it kind of renders us like sort of vague and mm -hmm. unreachable. If you were going to um, advise people who teach social problems, um, is there any specific, besides what you started with, in terms of, of critical thinking, are there specific that's things what, that you would That's what I with? would do. I would, I would say that um, rather than having a unit on poverty and then a unit on, on drugs and then a unit on da 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 I would have the whole thing on, let's look at, let's look at our values. Okay, what kinds of values says that kids in cages are okay? And I'm not saying that as a, as a, as a blow-off line. Right. But I'm saying that there are values, right? And the values are um, immigrants are, are bad, da 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 da, da. If, you, if you outlined all of that, <coughs> what you see is that it's cohesive. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's cohesive. Kristen Luker, a long time ago, wrote a book called... Um, Abortion and the Politics of Motherhood. Very old book now. But it was during the height of after Roe versus Wade, and there was a whole bunch of stuff going on. And she became a member of both the pro-life and the pro-choice movement. Um, the extreme people. Those who say abortion for any reason, and those who say abortion for no reason. And what she did is she started out with, who are these women? What do they believe? And how is it that these beliefs make sense? And by the end of the book, what you understand is a whole worldview. And once you understand what the worldview is, it's not just about abortion. Abortion in the politics of motherhood is about motherhood. So it's not just about abortion. Yeah, it's not about abortion, okay? And kids in cages or uh, killing off dictators or whatever, okay? That's, it's not about that. And I think that... Our public debate isn't productive 
because we're squabbling, fighting over this and that and that, 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 right? We need to figure out what are the underlying issues, the meaning making, okay? Yeah. What are the underlying issues? Because that's what we need to talk about. And I mean, I, I guess I'm, I really am very idealistic this way, but I do think that if we could talk about the underlying values and not simply mine are right and yours are wrong, or you know, everything I, everything I say about you will be how you are good, or everything I say about you will be how you are bad. Mm -hmm. if, we, if we taught students, we taught ourselves, we taught students these, how we make meaning, and then what the meaning does. I think I think we'd be better off. Do you think empathy? I'm, I'm thinking oh, yeah. empathy while we're talking about this. <coughs> empathy because sympathy. it gives you a tool to exactly, be able to understand. Exactly. But the problem is when you get into sociology of emotion, it's um, it's sad but it's true. It is far easier to encourage negative emotions. Yeah. Than positive emotions. Negative emotions. There's actually. Of course, my sociology friends say, never quote biology, but there's actually a thing in the back <laughs> of the of brain stem. Fear, anger, those are almost reflexive. Yeah, and they're very Darwinian. Compassion, sympathy, joy, love, patriotism, those positive emotions, those are social. Yeah. And so it's harder to conjure those, but those are the ones that we need. Though I do have a theory that empathy, that we start out biologically, is more empathetic than we become. Some people say that. But that's, yeah. Because when you're a baby, you got to figure out what the big people are thinking yeah. if you yeah. want to figure yeah. out exactly. how to get what exactly. you want. Exactly. So you spend the first part of your life trying to see the mm -hmm. other person's point of view. Yeah. And I sometimes yeah. wonder if we don't develop out socially yeah. Yeah. some people some people do say that yeah that um yeah because part of sociology of emotion there's there's huge debates you know how much is wired in and how much isn't and, and i'm an extreme construction this is why i think that very little is actually yeah. wired in because it might be fear might be easy to conjure but then stop for just a second fear of what yeah. Right, fear of what? Um, we're not born with a fear of the other. We're not born with a fear of snakes. We're not yeah. born with any kind of fears. We have to be taught what to be fearful of. So it, it again. But we are to... born, I think, with a particular kind of innate way of reacting to that fear. So once yeah. we are taught yeah. that snake is bad, then yeah. it's like you said, yeah. it's almost yeah. Reflexive, but but part of that that we panic when we see it. There's a difference between because this gets into social change. What can be changed and what can't. Yeah. Um, the reflexive part, you probably can't do anything about that. But around this reflexive part, I mean, because there's the there's the startle complex. You know, if you get startled, and that's just you don't have control over that. Yeah. That's not social, right? Um, but it's all meaning making. Yeah. You know, and it's, and it's the emotion, cognition, morality. Um, and I don't know, I, I think that um, we could do more with, with training students how to look at an argument, you know, like a news broadcast, or whatever, and ask, in what ways is this appealing to thinking? In what ways is this appealing? In what ways does this assume I have a particular morality? Yeah. Right? Because, because most of us, the way that the world that we live in now is that, you know, people divide themselves up on what news they watch. And it's to the point now that um, half of the population can't watch Fox News. Just like, ah! Yeah. Half the population can't, can't watch MSNBC. Yeah. Right? And it's like, you think, that's really interesting. But if you go back and forth between the two, you can see what it is, that, that these are different views of the world. And the problem is that if you segregate yourself to only getting that one, you know, if, if, if I could rule the world, I would tell people that. 
for every hour you watch Fox, you must watch one hour of MSNBC. And vice versa. For every yeah. hour you watch MSNBC, you must watch one hour of Fox. I, I, I would have that be a rule for yeah. everybody. Because I think that after a while you start to say, oh, I see what it is. It's not that these other people are bad. They are different. Yeah. And it is bad once you crawl inside that. But that's not a way to do social change. Yeah. Social change has got to be that we need different stories. We need different stories that are going to... I think the other thing is um, getting away from there's only two sides. Yeah. Yeah, the false dichotomy also, yeah. I think, is hurting quite a bit. Very much so. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, I have a particular perspective being a person who lives with disabilities, mm -hmm. but I often see debates at times, and I'm like, neither side is getting it's not it. Right. It's not right. Yeah. You know, there's this whole other perspective, but like you say, who gets to testify and yeah. who doesn't get to testify? Yeah. And it's like anybody who's trying to be quote unquote fair thinks that if they've got pro con, yeah. They've, they've yeah, won and the whole and, and, and the whole middle. Yeah. And, and and then we look at at you know surveys and whatever we find that Americans are just like there is no middle anymore. Yeah. Um, of course there's no middle because we're not allowed to have a middle. Yeah. You're trained to keep yeah, your mouth shut just, if you're not one or the other. Exactly. And that's another um, thing about social construction. We talk about um, what stories are told. But just as important, maybe more important, is whose stories are being silenced. Yes. That is just as important. Um, you know, because, because we know that, you know, the stories told by black women, you know, we know that those stories have been silenced. Uh, the Me Too movement is really incredible because it used to be that women's stories of sexual harassment were assumed to be false. Women were assumed to be telling, to be lying about it. But the Me Too movement has flipped that, so that now when a woman tells a story of sexual harassment, you're not allowed to to challenge it, and I think that's going to end up being just as bad. Well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, you have you a can't. whole yeah. historical context to that, yeah. from the, you talked about black women, black men, mm -hmm. and uh, because there is a history of false accusations mm -hmm of black men of rape. Mm -hmm. And I always cringe when I see like, you know, people arguing about this online when they're just like, oh, you have to believe her. And I'm like, I don't, yeah. if I were a black man, I'm not sure how I would feel yeah, about and you have and to believe her. I know, and, the, and that's, that's where the critical thinking comes in. Exactly. And I think that, yeah, so anyway, so, um, yeah, I'm a believer that, that this stuff should be taught. However, um, my experience has been that it's very difficult to teach it. Yeah. It's very difficult to teach it because students walk into these classes and they anticipate that there's going to be a liberal right. who tells them blah, 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 blah. They anticipate that the class is going to be easy because they know what the answers to the questions are. Because this not is that they, life. Not, not that yeah. they believe it, but they, they yeah. know what the answers to the questions are going to be. And when you say we're going to focus on thinking, students can become quite confused because I don't think that we, we faculty in general, um, are doing that much to encourage students to think. I think that students have um, gone through with multiple choice tests. There's a quality of mind, which is up to sociologists, right? The C. Wright, the C. Wright Mills, the quality of mind. Mm -hmm. That I think it is our job to teach it, but I don't know if we do enough. I don't know if we've got the... Have you noticed a change in the last 10 years with students on testing? Because mm -hmm. this generation... With the, with has, the FCAT. Yeah. Because yeah. this generation has been taught to the test. Yeah. And, I, I actually um, had a student last yeah. semester. Um, I, I don't give like tests in class. I give them online, and I let them take it three times, open book, so forth. And I give them unlimited time. But I'm like, you can't wait until Saturday night before it's due to right, do this right, because right. the test is designed for you to be doing thinking and looking stuff up. And I get this email from a student, like it's due on Sunday, the last day of the semester, and they're emailing me on Saturday night. I can't find where you said this. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I didn't say it. This is implied. You need to think about the concepts that lead to this. 
And she responds, well, don't you want me to pass this test? <laughs> I want you to think. And I'm like, no, what, what I want you to do is learn sociology. Yeah. That's my goal. Yeah. But it was like, how could you give me something that I can't just go find the answer right here to answer the question? And I never had challenges like that until the last 10 years or so. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's too bad. Yeah. Well, anything you want to add? I think that's it. I, I think, think we got just it. about everything. Room for improvement, natural history, understanding, social change. We've solved the problems of the solved world. Solved the problems of the world. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Well, thank you. This was fun. I appreciate it. This was so. fun. Yeah.